So tonight we've got uh, Lorraine Walker and we've got John Robinson, both from the uh, Tom Baker Cancer Center and as I understand now, Holy Cross site. These folks move around this city more often than you can shake a stick. Uh, hopefully we'll get everybody under one building sometime in the future, but I'm not sure when that future is going to be. It's a long way off. So I'm not sure who's coming forward first, but uh, come join us. And hopefully I do this correctly. Before we start, can I just ask how many people here are or have been on ADT? Good. Okay, good. All the Hi, experts audience. in the audience here. <laughs> so first we'll just introduce ourselves. Here's the mic. Um, Here's thank the mic. you. Yeah. Great. So I'm Dr. Lauren Walker. I'm a provisionally registered psychologist at the Cancer Center. Um, okay. Let me see. There, is that, is that better? Can you hear me better? Excellent. So um, I'm here today to tell you about our androgen deprivation therapy program. Um, I also would like to do a little survey and of anyone else come to the androgen deprivation therapy class at the Prostate Cancer Center. I see a couple of familiar faces, so great, good. Um, so I appreciate the invitation for us to come speak to you today about the program and as well about uh, the book that we've written to supplement and support that program. So my name is John Robinson. I'm also a psychologist in the Department of Psychosocial Resources <laughs> at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. Um, I've been working there too many years. I, some of the guys who are here used to say when I used to come I would stand out as being about the youngest one here and now I think I fit in quite nicely. Uh, and uh, So Lauren, I'll let you Thank carry you. on. So today, um, just to let you know that the program that we have developed has been supported in many different capacities by different organizations. Of course, Alberta Health Services funds uh, my salary and John Robinson's salary. Um, as well, we've had support for this program through Prostate Cancer Canada uh, and their Movember and True North funding initiatives, as well as the local Prostate Cancer Centre. So today we're going to tell you about our perspective and advice on um, how to live your best life while on androgen deprivation therapy. So tonight you'll learn the context for when androgen deprivation therapy is used as treatment. I think most of you, since you've raised your hand from being on the treatment, uh, you probably know that already, but we can certainly make sure we're all on the same page with the same information. We'll also tell you about the program of research that we have undertaken over the last decade or so. Uh, so some of you may know me well uh, on paper. You may have seen my name on consent forms and questionnaire packages that have probably been delivered to your house over the last few years. Um, if you were involved in those studies, that helped me to uh, complete my dissertation research on androgen deprivation treatment. We will also let you know today about some of the side effects of the treatment as well as different management strategies for dealing with those side effects. So by no means do you have to just cope with the side effects. We would like to share information about how to proactively deal with those so that there are things you can do to decrease the likelihood of experiencing side effects but also to cope and manage with them. So the first part of this presentation today, uh, I'm going to be speaking I'm going to be speaking more about the specific research that we've done and how we built the support for this program. So we began with a question in order to determine what were the needs of patients on this treatment. And not only patients, but what were the needs of couples. So not just dealing with the person that has the treatment, but also the people that are living with the person on this treatment. So the research that we've done and that colleagues have done has shown that androgen deprivation therapy side effects can be associated with significant declines in quality of life. 
And we know that physicians and nurses and pharmacists, healthcare professionals, put a great deal of effort into educating patients about the side effects of their treatment before they start on treatment. But unfortunately, a lot of this information is not retained by patients. So it might be that there's just so much information given in a consult that it's hard to remember everything. Or it might be that at the time the information is given, it's overwhelming and, again, can be challenging to remember everything that's said in those appointments. And so when we told our physicians that we were hearing from patients that they wished they knew more information about their treatment, we had had kind of a reply saying, but I spend a lot of time with my patients telling them about the treatment. So what do you mean? Does that mean that that information is not sticking with them? So we thought that it would be advantageous to set up a separate time for patients to come learn more about those treatment side effects. Okay, sure. So the other thing is that, as I mentioned, patients and partners are often coming to us as psychosocial staff saying that they wish they were more prepared for their treatment. They weren't aware that certain things that were going to happen to them were associated with their treatment and that they felt underprepared. The other thing to be aware of, as I mentioned, is that often the partners of patients actually report more distress than the patients themselves. So when we do studies and we give questionnaires out assessing for mood or anxiety or depression, sometimes it's the partners that are actually in significant distress. And the women's distress predicts men's physical health over and above the men's own distress, their age, and their cancer stage. So we really believe that it's important to work both with the patient as well as their partner if they have one. So just to review, there are a variety of different contexts for when one starts on androgen deprivation treatment. So sometimes it is administered in the short term alongside external beam radiation treatment. And so these patients would be given maybe one injection or two injections of the androgen deprivation treatment. And then they would also be given their external beam radiation. And that's because androgen deprivation can help enhance the effectiveness of external beam radiation treatment. Then those individuals would likely stop on the androgen deprivation and it would only be short term. Now other individuals are started on the androgen deprivation treatment in the case of biochemical failure. And what, what that means is that they've had some kind of primary curative treatment, something like a radical prostatectomy or radiation treatment, but then after that treatment at some point in time their PSA started to rise again. And so androgen deprivation is instituted to help control the PSA. The other case is when men are diagnosed at the time that they already have metastatic prostate cancer. So that means the prostate cancer has spread outside of the prostate and in some cases spread throughout the body, maybe to lymph nodes or bones. And if the person is diagnosed at that stage, then they would no longer be appropriate for a treatment like radical prostatectomy. And so this treatment is initiated. So when we're talking to men, we have to remember there's a lot of different contexts for being on this treatment. Some men will be on it short term, and some men will be on it long term. So there's a number of different forms of this treatment, depending on the geographical location that you're in or the region that you're in. Some drugs are supported by some regions, whereas in the US, you might have a different, different drug name than you would here. In the most common cases, men are given a luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone agonist. So that's the injection. In, in Alberta, men are started on Eligard. Sometimes they are also started on antiandrogen monotherapy, which is in the form of uh, an oral pill. So that's usually bicalutamide in our population here. Some men may be also on another variety of these medications. Estrogen is more of an experimental treatment and tr uh, trials are being conducted in the UK right now to um, propose that perhaps estrogen is a good way to control uh, prostate cancer. So lots of different 
uh, administrations here. Of course, when this treatment was first discovered, it was administered in the form of orchidectomy, which is surgical castration. And um, thankfully, we don't do that very much anymore. Um, obviously, that's a permanent treatment. And then for men that have uh, still been on this treatment and find that their PSA is starting to rise again, even though on androgen deprivation, there are two new forms of hormonal treatment, the enzalutamide and the abiraterone treatment. So some men in the room may be familiar with those treatment options, and they have similar profile or similar effects to androgen deprivation in the form of Eligard. So testosterone has a profound influence on the male body and has a variety of different roles. Uh, sometimes we think about testosterone in, in more obvious ways, thinking about uh, the male sexual organs and that it's responsible for maintaining penile size and for helping with erections and for sperm growth and um, in that fashion. But there is also a role of testosterone. Many people are familiar with the role in muscle development. And so being able to put on muscle mass when you're going to the gym, you're working out. Um, obviously men are a little bit uh, more able to put on muscle mass than women and that is due to the testosterone in the body. But if you follow all the way around this diagram here, you can see that testosterone has many roles in the body and maybe uh, in some ways we didn't even expect. If you're not a scientist or a physician and have a need to learn about that, it may be new to you to know that the testosterone does influence the heart and the kidneys, the liver, as well as the skin. Um, as well, bone density is an important factor influenced by testosterone. So men that are on this treatment will have a bone density loss. So you can see that if it, if it affects many different capacities, that there may be side effects associated with this treatment. So what we decided to do when we had several patients come to us and say, I wish I knew more, we thought, well, we need to make sure we can document that and show that in the literature. How much do men know about their treatment? So we surveyed men and their partners. We gave them a list of side effects. Um, some of the side effects that were on that list were not actually associated with the treatment, so they were what we called red herrings. So we put those in as well so that we knew that our participants weren't just checking everything off on the list. And what we found was that there was a significant lack of knowledge about the treatment side effects. So these are the results of this study. So you can see on the left hand side there, the results are kind of cascading down here so that on the left hand side is the rate that men knew about those particular side effects. So hot flashes, about 90% of men were aware that hot flashes were a side effect of treatment. Loss of libido was about 60% of men knew about that as well as erectile dysfunction. Um, gynecomastia there is breast growth, so about 50% of men had heard that it's possible they may have some breast enlargement on this treatment. And then you can see below 40% is everything from genital shrinkage on. So you can see weight gain, fracture risk, and all of these other side effects, as well as changes in emotion, depression, loss of body hair, all the way down here to the bottom. Um, the last one there says anemia, and only about five to 10% of patients knew about that. So we can see this whole purple circle here that less than 40% of people were aware that this might happen to them. And that's not, that's not enough. I think more patients need to know more about their treatment. What we also found from that study is that patients and partners hear different information and they remember different things about treatment. So the patients were significantly more aware or more likely to remember the sexual side effects of ADT, such as genital shrinkage, loss of libido, or erectile dysfunction. The partners were significantly more aware of the impact of the medication on the patient's mood and affect. So the things that we're saying in an appointment and trying to educate people, people are taking home different messages about what's important to them. So that led us to wonder what are the healthcare professionals saying to their patients? What do they feel is really an important thing for patients to know about? So we surveyed oncologists and urologists about their patient education practices. We asked them which side effects they felt were essential for patients to know about. And then we also asked them which management strategies they tell their patients about. 
And so this is the results showing uh, the percentage of physicians who judged specific side effects as important to inform patients about. So on the left hand side there is the side effects that are most important or endorsed as important by physicians. So they were saying, okay, it's essential and we all agree, 100% of us agree, that we need to tell our patients about osteoporosis, erectile dysfunction, hot flashes, loss of libido, loss of muscle mass, weight gain, breast growth. And as you can see, it starts to decline there and get uh, less unanimous. So there was more disagreement when you see more green on the top and more blue on the bottom. The green on the top shows that it was essential or important. The blue on the bottom shows that it was either not important to them or, in fact, they even avoided talking about those side effects with their patients. So on the right-hand side their infertility and loss of body hair were ones that physicians avoided telling their patients about. So over 80% of physicians were endorsing those on the left-hand side, which is great because it shows that there's a lot of consistency in, that, in those topics about what's important. But there is actually quite a bit of discrepancy on the right-hand side of this graph showing that there's some disagreement. Some physicians thinks it, think it's very important to talk about these things, and some physicians do not think that it's important. Now, when I conducted my study, I surveyed men to de determine which side effects they were experiencing. And these are the rates that I got. So at three months and at six months, this was the percentage of patients that were indicating that they had high or moderate bother associated with those side effects. So hot flashes, erectile dysfunction, fatigue, loss of libido were the really important ones that they were experiencing and that they were experiencing bother associated with, so they were distressing. Now, some people may wonder whether or not some of these kinds of side effects fall within the realm of our general practitioners. So if we're dealing with weight gain, um, changes to cardiovascular health, maybe it's the general practitioners that should be following patients on those characteristics. But what we found when we also surveyed general practitioners was that they feel uncomfortable counseling patients about androgen deprivation treatment and side effects. So they don't feel that it's in their area of expertise. So we, uh, my colleagues in Ontario surveyed 92 GPs who had patients on androgen deprivation and over 50% of them said that they administer this treatment annually to their patients. But 38% of them felt that the knowledge of ADT side effects was inadequate. They didn't have enough information. And 50% felt uncomfortable actually counseling their patients. Many were not well informed about the incidence of these side effects and the majority expected the specialists to take care of educating patients, so the oncologists in the cancer center. So that led us to an initiative to be involved with continuing education for family physicians. So we've led some webinars in order to help educate physicians more about this treatment. Now you may ask, well, we're in the age of Google. Can't our patients just Google this information and find it online? And yes, people are likely to do that. But we have even reviewed some of the medical literature to determine how accurate the information is that's out there. And so in a review that my colleagues in Vancouver conducted, they showed that only a quarter or a fifth of the papers that are out there mention any impact on partners and only a third of them mention depression as a possible side effect. So there's a lot of inconsistency in the medical literature that's out there. And a quarter of the medical papers actually had drug company support. And we showed that those papers with the drug company funding were more biased and less likely to report certain side effects. So we are a little bit suspect about what information is out there and we thought we do need to create a comprehensive place where patients can go and make sure they're getting reliable and accurate information. And this led me to conduct a review of the medical literature to survey uh, and determine how prevalent these side effects are and how likely patients are to experience each of those. So we use this as a teaching tool in uh, the Cancer Center. So 
What we found in trying to develop a clinical program in order to help patients be more aware of what's going on and be more proactive is that we had to actually show that in the literature. We had to sh demonstrate that there was a lack of knowledge, that there was disagreement among physicians, and that we needed to all get on the same page about what we were going to educate patients about. And we really do feel that having that research support and having those of you who participated in our studies is that that was really essential in allowing us to promote the development of a clinical program and to get the buy-in from the physicians in order to be able to make this program successful and sustainable. So I'm going to invite John up for the remaining portion of this talk and then I will come back up again uh, for our question and answer period. Thanks, Lauren. So let me see if I can figure out how this works. It wasn't advancing on the computer, so oh. I just looked up the slides. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about um, what we've done to try to apply what we've learned through the research. One of the things that, that we did was to get together and, and to write this book. Um, and we're not here on a book tour to pr sell you the, the book, but essentially to let you know that this is a resource that is available to you. And there's a whole, what we call an ADT educational program that we have built around this book that uh, we want to tell you about. So our job, <laughs> that we took on was to try to improve the lives of men on ADT. Given what Lauren was saying, uh, you learn that lots of men feel that they're not fully informed. Um, there was a bit of a joke here before we started of whether that's a good thing or a bad thing not to know about all the side effects. And we can have a, I guess, a discussion or a debate about that. But um, over the course of time, one of the things that I I, I hear all too frequently is that, you know, I wish I had have known more before I started on this treatment. Not that I would have made a different choice, but I think most of us don't like to be surprised by things. And so our position was that we wanted to make information available for those who, who want it so that they do know what's involved in the treatment. And then the other part of that is that if people don't know about a side effect, then they can't take steps to prevent that side effect, because in some cases that's possible, or they can't take s steps to kind of mitigate or to soften that side effect. So that's where we think that, that having this knowledge is really powerful. So we have kind of a two-pronged approach to this. Um, one is to support patients, but we also recognize that we needed to work with our colleagues, physicians and nurses who are prescribing th this medication. As Lauren said, that when we presented some of these results, we showed how many uh, men and their partners really didn't know about a lot of the side effects. As Lauren was saying, the physicians were, I don't know what the right expression was, but I guess disappointed. Um, many of them had said, as Lauren, uh, pointed out that they already felt like they were spending a lot of time. We even heard I spend an inordinate amount of time with patients when we're prescribing the ADT. And so, goodness sakes, you know, it, is it just kind of going in one ear and out the other? And when we first started to talk, they had the idea that we were wanting them to spend more time with their patients. And we said, no, that's, that's not the case. We don't want you to spend more time, but we have some suggestions about more efficient ways of spending that time with your patients. So one of the things that we did was we reminded them that as healthcare providers, we're, while we have some influence, in most cases, patients actually don't follow the things that their physicians say. There's one study that's, that's quoted a lot about Simple things like prescribing antibiotics, and I'll look around the room to see if I see some smiling faces here. There's a large proportion of people, if they are, go to their physician, they get a script for antibiotics, who don't even go and fill that prescription. Of those who actually go and fill the prescription, 
there's only a small proportion of them that actually take that prescription of antibiotics as prescribed. So that reminds healthcare providers that just telling patients what to do, telling them what's good for them, really doesn't result in behavior change. And so if we're talking about something that's more involved, such as actively managing the side effects of ADT, we know that as healthcare providers, just telling people what to do isn't, it'll inform them, but it really won't translate into them taking an active role in managing the, the, their side effects. So the second part of this with the physicians was to begin to have them think about how they can more effectively spend that time. And that what we suggested to them was that in the time that you have in the consultation, of not trying to inform patients of all of these side effects. As you saw, there's a whole great big long list of them. But to try to help patients to tap into the inner motivation that is required for them to actually make the changes that are needed so that they can be healthy and well while they are on this treatment. We sometimes think about, you know, we need willpower in order to make changes. Well, where does willpower come from? I don't know. <laughs> if anybody has an answer to that, please let me know. I think it comes from us being aware of what our motivations are, what's important to us. And so, one of the things that we did um, was actually at a, at a retreat with a lot of the GU oncologists was to begin to, to write a script that physicians could use, not word for word, but a script that they could use as a guide for how to inform patients when first starting on ADT. I'll read this to you because if your eyes are like mine at the back, you're, you're not gonna be able to see this. So this is, this is what we wrote. Androgen deprivation therapy is an effective way to manage prostate cancer and to improve the effectiveness of external beam radiotherapy. ADT has been strongly recommended as an important part of the management of your prostate cancer. However, you should be aware it may cause many changes in your body. You may experience fatigue, weight gain, loss of muscle mass, an increased risk of osteoporosis, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. As I am sure you are aware, many of these changes can pose significant health risks. When prescribing ADT, we weigh the risks and the benefits of the treatment. It is essential that if you go on this treatment, you manage these increased risks through important lifestyle changes, such as engaging regularly in exercise and practice healthy eating habits, much like the changes people make to live healthier when diagnosed with diabetes. If you decide to follow through with the recommendations to start androgen deprivation therapy, I will be asking you to make a commitment to effectively manage your health while on this treatment. There are other changes you may experience that can also affect your quality of life, like hot flashes, breast growth, genital shrinkage, loss of libido, sexual dysfunction, loss of body hair, infertility, and changes in mood. It is important that if you, and if the partner is present, attend the androgen deprivation therapy class where you will learn how to manage these changes. I underlined what we think are some of the key messages here, and this is, this is how we developed this script, was to have the physicians begin to think about what are the key messages. Number one, yes, Patients need to be informed about what the potential side effects are. That's kind of a medical legal issue that in order for people to give an informed consent, they really need to know what that treatment involves. I don't know how clear it comes across, but the language that we've chosen here is to suggest to patients that they have an important role to play if they choose to take the treatment. Now, I can imagine lots of you are saying that you really didn't feel you had much of a choice in taking the treatment. But our belief is the more you feel like this is something that, that you've chosen to do, 
because you've weighed the risks and the benefits that you, in essence, own that decision, the easier it's going to be for you and the more you acknowledge that you have a role to play, that you're just not a passive recipient of this treatment, that you know your health is going to be managed by this medication, but you also have an active role to play in keeping yourself strong and healthy while on this treatment. So those are some of the key messages that we were suggesting to, to physicians in terms of when they have that precious time to begin with to, to convey to patients. And I don't know, I, I should have got you to time me in reading that, but it takes, what, about three minutes to, to read that script? And so one of the ways that we got physicians to buy into this is that they saw that if they had a script that kind of helps them really think through what the key messages are, that it can make that time that they spend with their patients a whole lot more efficient. So this is one of the changes that we're trying to do is, is to work with, with physicians and nurses to change the way in which they approach patients. And the other part, this androgen deprivation therapy class, um, Lauren asked if uh, people had attended, and we, we see that some people have attended this class. The idea here is to let people know about what the side effects are, but more importantly than that, to let them know that many of these side effects, there are things that can be done to prevent them or to lessen the effect of, of, of those side effects. So I want to give you a little bit of an idea of the approach that we take in this class. You may say, well, we've written this wonderful book. Why don't we just give that out to people? Let them go home and read it. You know, maybe that's enough. Well, Lauren didn't tell you about this, but one of the studies that she did <laughs> was actually to give out an earlier version of this book. And then, for some of you, you may have participated in that study, and then followed up to see, well, did you know more? Yes, you knew more. But then Lauren also asked, you know, were you actually using the side effect management strategies that were described in the book? And we found that the uptake of those management strategies was not all that great. So I go back again to this main point here is that, you know, we all know this, but sometimes as healthcare providers, it takes us a long time to catch on that just giving people information isn't enough. And even those people who have good intentions, you know, how many of us have made New Year's resolutions? How many of us have followed through on them, <laughs> right? Except for that one guy who says, I'll never make resolutions again. He was the only guy, right, who actually fulfilled his resolution. So one of our strategies in helping people to tap into that inner motivation, right, to, you know, to get in touch with their willpower, if that's what you want to, want to think about, is to invite people to begin to think about what's important to them. What, what makes their life rich? Um, what is it that they live for? Um, because that's what's going to drive us in terms of, of making changes in our life. So this is just an example of um, the different spheres of a person's life that, that somebody might begin to think about. So for many people, their family is a sphere of their life that's, that's really important to them. And then we ask people, okay, in order to really enjoy your family, what is it that you need? Well, you need to have energy, right? If you have children or grandchildren, you want to be able to go out and play soccer or baseball or whatever it is that you, that you like to do with your family. You want to be in a good mood. If you're despondent and depressed, well, you're not going to be able to enjoy your family very much. If you're in a romantic relationship, for many of us, that's one of the key uh, aspects of our family. We want to keep that strong and healthy as well. For people, they'll think that their work life is important. Now, whether that's work for pay or volunteer work or leisure activity, Again, the things that are important to help us enjoy that aspect of our life is having a good memory, 
being able to organize ourselves, and again, having the energy or the stamina to be able to do those things that are involved in our, in our work life. Another sphere that may be important to people is their appearance, right? Many of us, you know, pride ourselves in being physically fit, um, you know, not having too big a paunch. Um, and again, having, having that strength to be able to do the things that, that we want to do. So you see there's some overlap here amongst all these different spheres. I mean, these are just examples, and you may begin to think about, well, what are those aspects of your life that are really valuable to you and that, that really contribute to the, to the quality of your life? So then, in thinking about what's important to your life, then we encourage people to actually go through and think about each of those side effects and how those side effects may take away from their enjoyment of life. And then it's from that that people are, get the motivation then to say, okay, if my family is important to me and these side effects are going to affect my enjoyment of my family, that's what's going to motivate me to engage in the, in the activities that's going to help me manage those side effects. So let me try to give you some examples of this. Hot flashes. We had a joke about the hot flashes, right? I mean, that's, you know, as, as Lauren showed you, that's the first thing that people think of when they think about ADT is having the hot flashes. And, I mean, we can make a joke about it, and, and I think uh, a sense of humor is a good way of kind of coping and managing. But, at least in, in our experience, hot flashes are not all that benign. Some people have fairly mild hot flashes and they don't bother them too much. But for some people, they are very significant. Um, disturbs their sleep, wakes them up at night. In some cases, the hot flashes don't wake them up at night, but it lightens their sleep to the point where they're not getting a restful sleep. When we're not sleeping well, I mean, that affects our energy, makes us more fatigued, affects our mood, um, it affects us in lots of ways. Hot flashes as well, for, for some men, um, are embarrassing. Um, if, you know, we're going to a business meeting or other kind of an important meeting and we break out in a sweat, um, that can be embarrassing for us. And for some men, they will actually avoid certain situations because they are concerned that, you know, they're going to be embarrassed by a hot flash. So we try to take people through some uh, thinking about, okay, if these hot flashes are troublesome to me, you know, in what way might they actually interfere with, with, with my enjoyment of life? And as I say, that's what motivates people then to take some actions. So there actually are a whole host of things that people can do to help with the hot flashes. Lots of people think, well, it's just something that I have to put up with. And, you know, sometimes the women kind of say, well, now you know what I went through. And as I say, the sense of humor isn't, isn't a bad thing, but something as simple as abdominal breathing or deep breathing, um, you know, where we, when we teach people, we encourage them to put their hands on their tummy so that they can feel their tummy rising and falling as they draw a breath deeply into their lungs, so it's like, and then breathing out. So taking just two or three of those nice deep breaths, if somebody is feeling a hot flash come on, can actually keep that hot flash from really developing and rolling and, and turning into a, a full-fledged hot flash. I and mean, we can get into the mechanism of that. If you're familiar with autonomic nervous arousal, essentially what you're doing is you're reducing that level of autonomic uh, arousal in your body so that it's not feeding into increasing the hot flash. Some people actually get into the habit of taking some time, maybe two or three times during the day. It only takes like three or four minutes to take some of those nice deep breaths to let go of the stress that normally builds up in our body so that you're keeping kind of that baseline level of stress at a lower level. 
And it's been shown that that can reduce the intensity and the frequency of hot flashes, simple, something as simple as that. Lauren found this next quote here, all that a man achieves and all that he fails to achieve is the result of his own thoughts. So what that reminds us of is the way in which we think about something can really change our experience of it. So if we feel a hot flash coming on and the thoughts that kind of cascade and follow from that are like, oh my goodness, here comes another hot flash. These are the worst things in the world. I don't know whether they're ever going to stop. I hate these things, you know, I don't want to go out and tonight I'm going to be, you know, soaking the bed. You can probably get the picture, right, of, of somebody who is thinking of the hot flashes and kind of telling a story about how awful they are. And what that does as well is it kind of increases the stress level, the autonomic nervous arousal and can actually exacerbate the hot flash. As opposed to thinking about other thoughts that might actually be more soothing and more calming. Thoughts like, yes, here comes another hot flash. I don't like them. They're not pleasant, but they're not the end of the world. Going back to that weighing the costs and the benefits, that this is a small price to pay for a treatment that is important to my health. And that there are some things that I can do to manage these hot flashes. I can take a few of those deep breaths. I can fan myself a little bit. So the way in which we talk to ourselves or, or look at a hot flash, again, can make a difference in how we experience it. And there was your cartoon that didn't come up about taking a medication to deal with a medication. We're not big fans of medication, but on the other hand, if people are really suffering from the hot flashes, um, there are some medications that, that really can make a huge, huge difference. So again, the message here is not to kind of suffer in silence and figure that, well, this is just something that I have to put up with. Weaker bones. That's another thing that is concerning to people because, you know, we want to be healthy and fit. We want to keep our body strong so that we can enjoy our family and, and enjoy our leisure activities. We don't see uh, the osteopenia or the osteoporosis. It's, it's, it's something that we can't see. And so that's one of the side effects that we think is important for people to know about so that they can actually do some things to keep their bones strong and healthy. So what can you do? Well, we do recommend that when men start on ADT that they have a baseline bone mineral density exam so they know what the strength of their bones is going into the treatment. And then probably periodically to have a reassessment, particularly if, if the um, bone mineral density is showing some beginning weak, weakening of the bones. Exercise is probably the single best thing that we can do to keep our bones strong and healthy, right? Taking calcium and vitamin D are strongly recommended and I think hopefully everybody has been recommended to to take calcium and, and vitamin D when they're on ADT. If you're a smoker, stop smoking. And again, there are medications that can be given. They're typically reserved if, if the man is starting to have bone loss. It's not given in a preventative way, but if the man is starting to have bone loss, there are medications that, that can be taken. One of the things that that Lauren found in, in, in a study that she did where she went out and, and she interviewed men about what it was like to be on ADT, which, how it changed their lives. One of the things that she found was that men and their partners would say that these physical side effects were a challenge and they were difficult. But the single thing that was most difficult to manage with were changes in the relationship that that's where couples struggled the most. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about that because that's where we found that, that ADT most profoundly affected men and their partners. The question here becomes about, well, what do we do about it? Lots of men will say that 
well, you know, I was already having some sexual difficulties prior to going on ADT. If I had surgery or radiotherapy, you know, I was already having problems, you know, getting an erection. Maybe we'd stopped, you know, being all that sexually active. And so they hadn't anticipated that when they went on ADT, that that loss of libido, that loss of sexual drive, would really have the kind of effect that we often see. When I talk to men, you know, one of the things that I'll say is that, you know, is there a change in your relationship? And lots of men will say, well, yeah, there is. We're just not as physically connected, we're not as emotionally connected as what we used to be. And I'll ask, you know, do you hug, do you cuddle, do you kiss as much as you did before? And lots of couples will say, no, we've kind of gotten away from that. And some of the sad things that, that we do here is that, you know, couples will say, you know, we're really good friends, we care about one another, but, you know, we kind of feel more like brother and sister now than as, as husband and, and wife. And we've kind of lost that kind of romantic aspect of our relationship. And so actually in, in the book, we've, we've got a couple of chapters um, talking about the changes in the sexual relationship and in the relationship. And I think it's the first paragraph um, of the book on the sexual relationship is that we encourage uh, men and their partners to read it even if they haven't been all that sexually active prior to going on ADT. Because as I say, these changes are, are changes that people hadn't necessarily anticipated. So for many people, they have to make kind of a concerted effort to remind themselves that it is important to have those exchanges of physical affection. And I put up the gummy bracelet here. Um, I learned this from one of the fellows that, uh, that came to see me because he said, yeah, you know, I just kind of forget about being physically affectionate to my wife. Without kind of that sexual drive, there's nothing there to cue me, to remind me that this is, that this is important. And I'd asked him earlier about the bracelet that he was wearing. It wasn't actually a blue one for prostate. It was a different color, and I, I asked him about that. And he said that he was wearing this bracelet because a friend of his had died from another cancer. And this was a really good friend, somebody who he had admired. And he wore the bracelet because he, he wanted that bracelet to keep the memory of his friend present in his life. And so when he felt that bracelet, he'd remember his friend. So I said to him, well, can you do something like that to remind yourself that it is important to be physically affectionate with your partner? And his solution was to say, well, this bracelet can serve both of those purposes. It can remind me of my friend, but it can also remind me that I need to be appreciative and physically affectionate with, with my partner. Another thing that we encourage people to, to be clear about is their beliefs or the way in which they talk to themselves. And I'll give you just a couple of examples of, of, uh, of the way in which we try to work with men and their partners in this regard. So we try to help people identify what some of their beliefs are and, whether, and then to look at those beliefs as to whether they're helpful beliefs or whether they're not helpful beliefs, whether they're actually accurate or whether they're not accurate. So a belief might be that you know, my partner has no sexual drive or libido because he no longer desires me. You know, if I was, you know, sexier or didn't weigh as much, then that would, that would help him with his sexual drive. So you can look at that belief and say, well, is that, is that actually true? And is that a helpful belief? And a belief that actually may be more accurate and more helpful would be that, yes, my, po my partner no longer becomes sexually aroused, but he still loves the way that I look. And he likes cuddling and physically pleasing me still. Belief that a man might have is that as a man, if I can't have an erection, 
I can't satisfy my partner. A challenging belief to that, a different belief that might be more helpful, I can still please my partner. I can ask my partner what her needs are now and how to please her in other ways. So in the book we have exercises to help people identify what are their beliefs, what are their attitudes, to really inspect them to see are these helpful beliefs, are there other beliefs or ways in which you can talk to yourself that actually might be more life enhancing. So let me try to summarize here. Look at my summary slide. <laughs> so what are, what are the key messages here? I guess one is that ADT um, can be a very effective treatment for prostate cancer. It can extend life. It can you know, prevent the onset of, of symptoms of prostate cancer. And we've been talking about all of the symptoms. But we need to keep in mind that, that there is a reason to be taking this treatment. Yes, we have to weigh the costs and the balances of it. And we have to begin to think about if we're on this treatment, what is the role that we can play to make sure that we do keep ourselves you know, healthy with respect to our body and our mind and our relationships. What we do suggest is that people actively monitor their side effects. That in the book we give, uh, there's a questionnaire that asks about each of the side effects, asks people to keep track of whether they're experiencing the side effect and then the degree to which it's bothering them, so that they can kind of tap into that inner motivation about, okay, what's happening here? Am I, are these side effects getting in the way of me enjoying my life? And then coming up with a plan, and that was the, the, the next slide here is of actually coming up with a plan as to what you want to do to manage with those side effects. The example that I had here was again of this fellow who was saying that he wanted to be more affectionate uh, to his wife. And so that's a, that's a noble goal to have. Ah, here we are. <laughs> but it's kind of... Um, non-specific. So here we are. So his goal was to show his partner more affection. But then it's, it's helpful to break it down to say, well, how, how do I actually want to do that? And so here's an example where a fellow said, I want to give her a three-second kiss at least two times a day and say something that I appreciate about her at least once a day. Now there's some chuckles there. And, and we, we had talked about earlier about how sometimes we give our, 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 our partner kind of perfunctory kisses, just kind of pecks on the cheek as a, as a duty or obligation. And he said, no, I really want to give her a three second kiss to let her know that, you know, there is something special here. I want to keep that kind of romance around. So that was his definition of a something more than kind of a perfunctory kiss. And then going back to my point here about what's the motivation. So for him, and it helps sometimes to write these things down. I want her to know that I love her and that her relationship is important to me. When do I plan to do this? Every time I leave the house and I want to give her appreciation at meal time. So he's paired this behavior with something that he does every day. And then the question is, well, what might get in the way of that? And forgetting, for most of us, is the thing that gets in the way. So problem solving again, how can we remind ourselves? So for this fellow, his granddaughter had given him a, 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 a heart-shaped keychain that he didn't use and he says I'm going to dig that out and that's going to become my keychain so when I go to get my keys leaving the house that's going to remind me that I should go and give my spouse that three second, second kiss. This was a family that said grace so he says well I'm thanking God for what he's given me I'm going to make a point there of saying something that I appreciate about my wife today 
So he paired these things, these changes, these new habits, with something that was already going on in his life so that he would increase the chances of his best intentions of actually coming through. I'm just going to go through the, this one. So the take home points, right? ADT is a very effective treatment. If you, you decide what's important to you in terms of what makes the richness of your life, monitor your side effects so you know what's happening and how they are affecting your life. If you're in a relationship, be aware that this is probably one of the areas that needs some special attention. And that physical activity is probably the single best thing that you can do to manage all of these side effects. From the weight gain, the um, loss of muscle mass, the osteoporosis, dealing with the fatigue. And there's actually some evidence to show that men who continue to, to exercise or to get into an exercise program, those are the men who are most likely to continue to be sexually active as well. So I probably have overstayed my welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. <No. laughs> so you're the experts. Tell us if we're on the right track, whether what we're missing. Um, we'd, we'd welcome all of your comments and questions. Sure. How do you measure the effectiveness of androgen deprivation therapy? With the PSA is probably... With the PSA? Yeah. That's pretty, pretty good. It's the best we have. <laughs> so the PSA, the PSA declines when you're on the treatment and then usually stays down. If it starts to rise again, then that gives us an indication that the treatment isn't working as well as it was. And does that happen um, after a certain duration that it, it's less effective? It, it, cancer cells are very devious, and for some of them, they do, they do learn a way of growing despite being deprived of, the, of testosterone. Testosterone is kind of the fuel, the fertilizer, for prostate cancer, when you take it away, it dies off. You know, if you don't fertilize your lawn, it dies away. But then some strains of the grass will start to grow over time. Um, the good thing is for many men, though, that ADT controls their cancer for years and years and years. Our co-author here, Richard Wassersug, I think he's been on ADT for 15 years. And uh, at least a decade. He's, uh, he's going strong. And some of you, I think, may have met him. He came and uh, talked to the group, uh, I, I guess, a few years ago when you were down in, in Inglewood. And his uh, uh, video is on your, on, your, on your website. Yeah. John, you mentioned uh, as part of the presentation that there's an ADT class. Could you say a few words about that particular class, where it is, when it is, mm -hmm. exactly? Thanks. So as John mentioned, um, information alone is not enough to help people make changes in their behavior. So that's why we decided we needed a class in order to supplement the book, so not just giving out the book, where we invite men to come, they learn the information we shared with you tonight more in depth, and we engage in a number of exercises like that values clarification exercise with the little bubbles, determining what's the most important part in your life and how your treatment could affect that and also engaging in goal setting, the action plan. Um, what we've done is rolled out this program for all men that are new to starting ADT. So if you haven't been invited to the class, it's probably because you were started on ADT more than a year ago. So we've been running the class monthly since then. Um, if you are very, if you're interested, I, I think we could certainly accommodate if you wanted to attend the class, um, but we have sort of launched it for anyone that is new to ADT starting about 12 months ago. So we've been running the program for 12 months. If you're, it is hosted at the Prostate Cancer Center. Uh, we run it once a month. So you're more than welcome to contact me if you want more information about it or you just want to learn what we do there. Yeah, and people can call to the uh, Prostate Cancer Center Calgary and register for the class, right? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, before my PSA is uh, was uh, live, uh, but after I I eat uh, a a water, the drop a water a water. Some somebody say a water. Somebody say a water. Uh, after I ate the this drop for eight months, about eight months, my my PSA is down to four, uh, four, four zero, four point zero. Uh, I want uh, have a, 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 I have a question. When I stop, when I stop, eight the uh, this uh, drop, uh, a water. Uh, if my PSA is down, then. Uh, Five, five point zero or uh, or to six, seven. <laughs> Can I don't need uh, don't need uh, my box? Sorry, I missed the last part of what you said there. Can you say that again? The question. Yes. So just the last part of what you said. You said you were taking a drug yeah, for eight eight months. Eight months. Yeah. And when I when I. When I eat, eat uh, the booster, uh, uh, eight months, my PSA is start for lower. I remember it's a fee to three point eight. So your PSA declined while you were taking that medication. Yes. Uh, low, 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 low. Everyone, uh, Do you want it? Is, is that Avogar to be taking? Yeah, Avogar. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we can, yeah. Within six months, and I think uh, your your PSA, your 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 prostate will shrink and your PSA will go down. That is not, really, and it will stay down to approximately 50% of what it was beforehand. But that isn't an indication that you minimize the, the, the cancer at all. It's that that it's partially the shrinking up of the uh, prostate and, and the other effects of that part. So that uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so, and we can talk about this afterwards if you want. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Avidart is very similar to Elagard or to the other androgen deprivation medications. It's it's another one of them. Uh, you had a question, sir. Or, yeah, uh, I was going to say, I had a PSA of 24, and they started to be on the shots every three months for, uh, for 24 months. Mm -hmm. After that, my PSA was at nothing. They couldn't be funded. Yeah. So they wanted to be for two years, mm -hmm. just last fall. And the oncologist said, I'm referring you back to Yes, indeed. My question was, they had came out last year. New York, I think, some country said that they realized now with the recent studies, we should only be giving your, your shots for 15 months. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the big questions if you're having, you know, the ADT along with the radiotherapy about how long, you know, how long's enough and how long's too much. And so they, they said, my, I just read that, I think it's too much. Yeah. It comes so many veterans. Yeah. I said that they had said that really they shouldn't be doing it for 24 months. Yeah. Is that real? Yeah, and, and probably people here know that if the androgen deprivation therapy is given for the biochemical failure, right, if your PSA is going up after radiotherapy or surgery, that the recommendation now is to be giving it on an intermittent schedule, right, where you're on the medication for a while till the PSA comes down to a low level, then you come off of the, of the shots, you monitor, the PSA rises to a predetermined level, then you go back on to the ADT. And there's suggestions, right, that with that off period, that, you know, 
It's not as hard on the body that in terms of the osteoporosis, risks of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, all of those things that when you're off of that treatment, the testosterone comes back, that actually helps keep men healthier uh, than keeping them on it continuously. What's the best management for the night sweats? Well, the, the strategies we hear that work the best come from the patients themselves and they tend to say have a fan in your room so that the fan will blow cool air by your face and your skin. Use cotton sheets, breathable sheets. Use layers so you can toss the layers off if you need to. Um, or the other option is again considering a medication. If the medication decreases your hot flashes, then that would also happen at night. And have what a about a sleeping pill? I don't imagine the sleeping pill would have a lot of an effect on the hot flash. It, it might mean that you're conked out so much that you don't um, notice the effect of the hot flash. But I think that's, that's reasonable. If those hot flashes are disturbing your sleep, I mean, you might actually want to try the Effexor first, rather than a sleeping pill. Um, is the Effexor, is that, that's a prescription? Yeah, yeah. See, the doctor put me on the sleeping pill first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, what you'll yeah. find is that there's a lot of different options that could be appropriate, and sometimes it means trying one, evaluating whether or not it's working, and then trying another one. Yeah. Isn't what are your suggestions for fatigue where you don't have the energy to exercise? What an excellent question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what it is is a vicious circle, right? Yeah. Um, I'm too tired so I don't want to exercise, but the reality is that exercise is the best treatment for preventing and managing fatigue. So I'm too tired, I don't want to exercise. You, can't. you physically can't. You, know, you try and walk too far, you get halfway and you collapse. So what, what I typically recommend is, is doing some kind of exercise, not too vigorous, right? But to, yeah, scale it back and to divide it up into smaller chunks, right? So if your tendency is to think, I'm gonna go for a walk and I'm gonna go around the whole neighborhood, well then you're only gonna get halfway and then perhaps collapse. So maybe the best bet is to decide you're gonna walk for 10 minutes, to stop, take a break, uh, and then maybe again in an hour or so, walk for another 10 minutes. So dividing it up to make sure that you're still getting engaged, um, but in smaller, more manageable chunks. Any, any little bit helps. And, and prevention is the key. So if you can be proactive and get into a good routine now, then you can offset the presence of fatigue. I'll take one more question, and then if people have them afterwards, we'll stick around. Okay. Question of exercise. Uh, I go to the Y three days a week uh, for the last 10 years. But you go to the YMCA and that lady will write a, a program for you. So if you want some exercise, then try the YMCA. Yeah, and the University of Calgary has the Thrive program as well, which is free, and they will they have a space. You can come use that space. If you have a cancer diagnosis, you are more than welcome to come and use their facilities. And they have a special program for men on ADT. Wow. Excuse me, where did you say that word? At the University of Calgary, their kinesiology program. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Do you have information on that? Uh, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another excellent uh, facility and program for exercise is at Wellspring. I've been going there for the last four years. It's offered in the evenings, it's offered on Thursday afternoon and Saturday morning. And they have very highly qualified people who will help you design a particular exercise program that you're comfortable with. So that's enough, and it, and it is free. I mean, all of the Wellsprings programs, and there are many, many of them, in addition to the exercise programs, are free of charge. They're located on Home Road, and I'm sounding like a yeah, You're a Wellspring advocate. Yeah. <laughs> There's a pamphlets over there. An absolutely fantastic resource. Is the True North, is it, is Helen wanted, I was just talking to her about yeah. the True North. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. going to yeah. the university tomorrow for my yeah. first visit. Good. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's there is a, a form on the desk over there with a little tear-off sheet. 
uh, you can tear that off and give them a call and they will let you know about any programs you can participate in. Some of them are research based, some of them are not. So Lauren and, and, and John, <laughs> I'm going to have to have you exit the podium <laughs> and uh, do stay afterwards. Uh, the whole uh, building will be vacated by 9, 9.30 tonight. But uh, I'm just going to quickly go through. Let me, let me point you back. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Because I'm. <laughs>